Imagine if you were a part of a church that you felt was very um, active, very lively, and felt like uh, that your church was um, on par with God's program and what God and Jesus uh, Jesus Christ wanted uh, for your church. Um, and then you come to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whatever way that is, use your imagination. He tells you and tells the rest of the church that your church is dead. How would that strike you? I'm pretty sure that that, that would hit you like a ton of bricks um, and that it would leave you shocked. Um, and uh, you'd be wondering, well, what's going on? Why are we a dead church and not a, a living church? Well, imagine how the people in Sardis felt, because um, in Revelation chapter three, we read that uh, the church in Sardis had a had a reputation of being alive. But the true evaluation of their condition was that they were dead. Now we're going to look at this church um, in Revelation chapter three. We're going to talk a little bit about what might be going on behind this whole thing. Why was the church of Sardis dead and what would, and what could they do to remedy uh, this problem? So that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, some good things in store. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, well, after a couple of weeks of um, just taking a break from the book of Revelation, um, we are going to dive right back in. Um, as we're getting ready to start chapter three, we're in the middle, um, just kind of of a sub study within the entire book of Revelations, uh, Revelation, excuse me, um, of uh, studying the seven churches in uh, Asia Minor. So we've looked at all the churches um, in chapter two. That would be Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And uh, today we want to pick up on um, this whole thing of the with the church in Sardis. Now we're we're charting um, somewhat unfamiliar territory in the sense that this is the first of two, um, uh, uh, first of two churches out of the seven that has no positive words from the Lord Jesus, no, uh, no words of commendation um, uh, for this church. It's all rebuke. Okay, um, so and actually, you know, the all the rest of the churches, the rest of the three churches in chapter three. Um, you know, it's either all rebuke or all praise. So you have Sardis here, and then you have Laodicea, the last church that we're going to look at at the end of chapter three. Those two churches um, are churches that have no uh, no commendation, uh, no uh, word of encouragement or anything like that. Uh, it's all rebuke. Um, in between those two um, is the Church of Philadelphia, and the Church of Philadelphia has no word of rebuke against it, um, but all words of commendation, kind of like Smyrna. Smyrna was the other church um, out of the seven um, that had no words of rebuke, but all commendation. Everybody else, um, all the other churches, it was a mixture. You had uh, some words of commendation, but you also had um, some words of rebuke. Um, so as we come into this time here, um, with, uh, with Sardis, we're, we're entering into one of those churches, uh, that doesn't have any positive things, um, to say, um, th- to say about it there. And so we're going to talk about that and we're going to see why that is, um, as we, as we explore this letter. Um, before we do that though, let me just remind you once again, once again, of the pattern that we're dealing with here. Uh, when we look at these seven, uh, these seven churches, um, it's the same pattern that I remind you of each and every time that we that we enter into this study and, and when we look at an individual church. Uh, but pretty much as it starts out, you have the you have the beginning part where it says and to the angel, of the church in and then the city's name. In this case today, what we're going to be looking at is Sardis. And then the Lord Jesus identifies himself. He introduces himself in the letter based on uh, based on characteristics and descriptions that you see in chapter one. Um, you know, so again, you know, for example, like in, in, uh, in Ephesus, uh, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me. Then when you get into the letter, uh, much of the meat of the letter, um, is, um, is Jesus, uh, going over things that he knows about the church. It's the, it's the, I know you part of this. Um, and most of the time in the, in these churches, he, he starts out by saying, I know your works or I know your deeds, or I know your situation or something along those lines. So this is, we're dealing with a savior. He was very, uh, intimately knowledgeable about each of his churches that he walks among. Okay. So he says, I know, I know this, I know that uh, about you. And usually that, that will lead into, um, 
messages of commendation and rebuke um, where he says that you have these good things going on for you, um, but I hold these things against you. Um, and so within that, um, especially attached to the whole thing, I have this against you. There's a, um, there's a prescription, so to speak of, you know, of what they need to do in order to rectify the problem. A lot of the times it's, it's a matter of repentance. Um, and again, that's going to be one of the things that we see here, um, with, uh, Sardis, um, in, in this, in this letter here. And then the last part, um, you know, is, is the, he, uh, the one who conquers section, I, I call it, you might call it the uh, the one who conquers slash um, he who has an ear let him hear uh, section. Those usually go together. And unlike the unlike the the main body of the letter, the I know uh, the the I know part, um, Jesus is ad- uh, addressing in the I know part. He's addressing things specific to that church. Uh, but when we get to the, the those who conquer, um, he mentions uh, promises that are true not only for that local church, but is also true for all Christians in every in all churches throughout time. Okay, and we know again we know that because we see the same descriptions um, in that local letter also apply to all Christians um, in latter parts um, of the Book of Revelation. So again, that's a reminder of the patterns that we're seeing um, um, as it relates to uh, these letters to these uh, churches in Asia Minor. So um, our text today is verses one through six, and let me just read um, all of those to you. Um, this uh, covering the the uh, Lord's message to the church in Sardis. Okay, so in Revelation chapter three, starting in verse one, it says, "And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write." the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." All right, so that's the letter to the, the the letter to the church in Sardis. And as you read, as you heard there, um, as I was reading through that passage, there was um, there was no word of commendation um, offered to uh, offered to this uh, this church. Um, it was all rebuke. So he starts out. You know, let's go back to the introductory part here, uh, a, a form that we're very familiar with by now, just as in our study of these of these letters. Um, it says, and to the angel, and, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the and the seven stars. Okay, so again, that goes back to descriptions that we saw before in um, in Revelation chapter one. Remember, we saw the whole thing about the seven stars in the in the right hand um, of the of the Son of Man as he was standing among his lampstands. You know, we, and we can we can chalk that whole thing up to to. Uh, um, the Lord's possess, possess, uh, possession of his churches. Uh, you might also see it as a, as a way of symbolizing protection and that sort of thing. So these are, these are churches that belong uh, to him. And actually, you, having that in our mind is, is going to be very uh, important for us to have in our minds when we, when we uh, um, examine the reality of what's going on um, with the church in Sardis. Uh, but again, we also talk about uh, he, uh, him who has the seven spirits of God. Um, we talked about this, you know, even we, we've been, uh, we've encountered this whole thing of seven spirits, um, even before we get to the description of the son of man. And of course we know and understand that the seven spirits is not talking about the, uh, seven Holy spirits. Uh, but since seven in a highly symbolic book like revelation, um, and even in other parts of scripture, you know, that, that, uh, seven is a, is a number that, uh, depicts the, uh, uh, completeness. Um, we're talking about the the spirit in his fullness, and you might see that as uh, fullness in power, fullness in knowledge, um, that sort of thing. Um, we're going to be exposed once again 
uh, to this whole concept of the seven spirits in um, later passages, um, mainly in chapters four and chapter five um, of Revelation. And obviously we'll talk about that more when we uh, when we get there. But that's who we're dealing with. And that's how Jesus um, identifies himself to this church in Sardis. Now, he says there still in uh, still in verse one, I know your works you have and here it is listen to this 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 is this is the hard punch that i mean if you were a member or a part of the leadership in the church in sardis this these words coming from jesus christ himself would serve as a gut punch that would just knock the wind out of your sails um and it says he says i know your works you have the reputation of being alive but you are dead okay wow You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, what in the world is going on here? Now, right off the bat, let's let's settle something here, because we we might think of something about, you know, a deadness, a dead, a dead church or something. You might think, okay, you know, we're we're talking about death within a church. Um, are we talking about the spiritual condition of the people who make up this uh, this church? In other words, are we dealing with a, a a church made up of people who aren't believers? And um, I would be one who would quickly say, no, that's not what we're dealing with here with the church in Sardis. A, a church made up of unbelievers isn't a church. Um, that's that's a contradiction. A church of unbelievers is not a church. And the and the Lord Jesus Himself identifies uh, Sardis, the, the believers in Sardis, as a church, uh, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? You know, so they are acknowledged as um, as a church. Also, if you go a little bit later into what um, uh, what he's uh, what he's talking about there, um, just as far as what they need to do, um, where he says, uh, I guess it's. Um, I guess it's right in the next verse. In verse two, he says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. So we're not even talking about a full death as in the church is fully dead, um, but it's well on its way. And it's identified as as dead. Uh, It's identified as dead um, because for the most part, there's very, very little life and vitality in that church. Now, if we're talking about uh, a church, or a, that's not really a church if it's unbelievers, but if we're just talking about uh, predominantly unbelievers uh, within this assembly, it's not a matter of these people becoming more and more dead until life is no longer there, it, because a, a spiritually dead person is a spiritually dead person. They were born that way. They were never alive and then became dead, okay? Uh, theologically speaking, that's that's how you that's how you should look at this. So when we're talking about the death of this church, a dead church, in the form of Sardis here, what we're dealing with is is um, the church's uh, vitality, its life, its usefulness, um, that sort of thing. Even if you think about churches in the 21st century, we're no strangers to this, and you might even know of churches in your community that that die. Um, you know, there are, there are people within their own churches that recognize the death of their own church because of, uh, perhaps certain things that are, that are going on. We recognize, um, many dead churches. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, this is the really, um, uh, this is what gives this, this letter such a knockout punch, um, to these people in Sardis is that when we think of a dead church or a church that's dying or, or that sort of thing, uh, we, we'd like to think that we could recognize it, especially if you're within that congregation. You understand that, that, you know, that spiritual life within that, within that assembly is dull. You might know of sin, unconfessed sin that's going on and is rampant all over the place. There's a sense that God's power is not among this people. And it's just, it's just lethargic. And it's just a matter of, you just feel like you're just there and nothing. There's no power going through there. Uh, through through the members of your church and anything, and it's just like this church is dead, and even people in the leadership will uh, will sometimes recognize that. So that's why they hire consultants. That's why they hire church consultants and say, "Hey, come on, you know, can you come and 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 inspect us and check us out because we're dying and we're on our last thread here." You know, so in in many cases, in in certain contexts of certain churches, uh, we we might be able to to recognize and understand that that there are certain churches that are dying, in the process of dying, or is already dead. You know, 
and we might be able to recognize that. But we, but here's the thing: the our our thought of the deadness of a church is limited to that sort of picture in our minds. We think of a dead church or a dying church. We might think of a of a church that has very few numbers, even though few numbers in church doesn't doesn't signal that the church is dead. That's I think sometimes an an unfair uh, assessment. Although a lot of many churches that are dying are few in number, um, but you have you you know uh, you know it, it's just something where there's just no vitality in there, uh, nothing's going on, there's no power, um, and and that sort of thing. That's how we that that's what we think of when we think of a dead church. Sardis's uh, whole thing here. Is that as it says there in uh, in in verse one? It says you have the reputation of being alive. Okay, and I think and there's no there's no reason to to think or believe that um, that the that the church disagreed with this uh, with this uh, assessment of their reputation. You know, word was out. I mean, whether it was maybe from uh, surrounding churches in other in other cities or. What I think might be more likely what's going on, the reputation within the community of Sardis, that the, that, uh, the reputation of the, of, of the Sardian church, that they, that they were alive. Okay, now understand what I'm saying here, because uh, you know, most likely what you're dealing with, and this is the case in, in many of the places that you go to in this part of the world at that time, you only had one church within a community. So if we're, talk- if we're talking about a reputation, a good reputation within the community, that this church is alive. What, what is this? Who who are holding the, this reputation of the church being alive? Unbelievers, right? And so that, in a way, is is somewhat part of the problem. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. Isn't it good? Don't we want to have a good reputation? Not only among among people within our number with with other believers, but even a good reputation on people of the world. Yes, we're not. I'm not saying that we that that reputation is never important when it comes to people of the world because we want to live as lights in the midst of the world to shine off Jesus Christ to other people. But the question is, what is producing that good reputation? You know, so, you know, I, I can, and this is, this is where I think the, the, the problem really, uh, you know, comes in, um, is that what you might be dealing with here with Sardis and the reason why they have a reputation of being alive among people within the within the city of Sardis, but in fact that they are dead, is because their their alive reputation came uh, has come um, um, at the expense of hard gospel truth and hard gospel ministry. So that what you have here is um, a church that is. And, and I hesitate to say compromising on the gospel because I don't know if that's really the appropriate term either. Um, but who don't put as much emphasis on the gospel or at the very least the offensive parts of the gospel message or what's written in scripture or taking a hard stance on things that would serve as a heavy conviction on people of the world in exchange for favor from people on the outside. And the, and the justification might go, well, we need to be in good favor with people in the world, you know, in order to win them in. And we're not going to win them in if we offend them. So, you know, maybe stay away from this here, this here, this here, this here, or don't say this, 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 or that. Um, things that are mentioned in scripture and things that maybe that we might say that we're commissioned to talk about and speak about, not only in the church, but also in society at large. And we say, yeah, we don't. We, we want to stay away from those things because we want to have good favor among the people within this community. Did you notice that here in Sardis that you're not that one of the things that you're not dealing with um, that you kind of have to some degree or another um, in um, in some of these other churches that we looked that we looked at that there's no problems of persecution or um, or threats of 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 uh, uh, physical harm or, or imprisonment or death or anything like that. No martyrs as far as what we can see here um, in Sardis, uh, you know, that sort of thing, um, as opposed to Pergamum who had to uh, endure the whole thing at the martyrdom of their faithful witness, Antipas. 
um, Smyrna, who's, uh, where Jesus said that they're going to be in prison for 10 days and to, and to stay faithful, even unto death. I mean, we're not seeing any of those things here. None of those dangers are, are looming on the horizon, uh, for a city like Sardis. And it's not like we're dealing with a, a city that is far removed in Asia Minor from all these other ones. I mean, you would think that, um, you know, in some sense, there might be still some of those things looming in, in some of those areas. Now, maybe that's a right or wrong. Th- maybe that's a wrong thing to think. I don't know. But um, it, it is a, a, a noteworthy thing to, to recognize that um, there isn't any sort of um, um, threat of persecution from, from people um, of the community. And listen, people who threaten persecution or, or they make their hatred towards Christians and Christianity known, they do that because they know what Christianity propagates. They know what they teach. They know what they say. They know what they, how they live and what they live by. In a lot of cases, that is very convicting to people of the world, and they don't like that. So what do they do? They want to get rid of the church in that area or many of the Christians in that area. We don't see that here. Instead, we see we, all we see is something where you have a good reputation. Now, again, like I said, reputation is important to a certain degree. You want to have a good reputation in the sense that you are living according to what you preach and what you believe. You don't want to be caught, you you or the leadership or anybody else doesn't want to be caught in a scandal, um, a sinful scandal that will result in p- uh, people of the world looking and saying, yeah, see those hypocrites, you can't trust them and, you know, that sort of thing. You want to have a good reputation where, you know, people, your church is, is known for, hey, these people really do live and walk in a righteous way as they as they speak about righteousness and you know and everything like that doesn't mean that they're perfect but i mean by and large uh they center their lives around living for the lord jesus christ and in his righteousness according to the power of the holy spirit but there can that but there can be a reputation among people of the world a reputation that's glowing um that is favorable um, when a church decides to stay away from the offensive things and to cater to um, the things that they know that people of the world would uh, would rather hear or that they would like to hear, okay? It, it, it's interesting. You know, we, we talked about the dangers in some of these other churches about uh, about aligning themselves within the, within pagan systems in order to win favor with them. In Sardis here, you don't even have that sort of danger, it seems like. Um, there may have been paganism, paganism to a certain degree, but you know, winning the favor of the people didn't even necessarily have to mean joining them um, in pagan practices or anything like that. It could it could be a wide range of things, um, and really, I think that that that's what uh, that that's what we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, falling in line with what uh, with what you believe that the world wants from you instead of what God. And Jesus Christ wants from you and going the path of what God wants and what the head of the church, Jesus Christ wants, um, which naturally runs against the grain of what society, unbelievers, what the world is all about, um, you know, will cause, will, will cause a lot of trouble, um, for Christians and for the church, um, altogether. So, in order to avoid that, let's just let's just not go let's not go the Lord's way. Let's not go Jesus Christ's way, but let's just do our own thing so that we can so we can be in a better position of winning favor with the world. And the, I think the thought in a lot of people's minds is that if we go this way, we're in a better position to win people over for Christ. Not really realizing that what they're offering is a sham. Okay. And so I think that that's that's what you're that's what uh, that's what's going on here with the church in Sardis. So they have this reputation uh, for being alive. And in, before I go on, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this one area here, but I, I think it, it's worth noting that, you know, not only this, but I mean, if we're, I'm, I'm just trying to think about this in, in a 21st century context as well. You know, a lot of times we, we, we equate a lot of things uh uh, to to uh, to things having to do with being alive or being a church that's alive, um, and a lot of that uh, will involve a lot of activity. If there's a lot of activities going on in the church, man, that's a lively church. 
those activities are geared towards winning people, you know, inviting people to this or that or this block party or this and that, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, man, that church is alive. It's doing it's and is because it's so active and because there's so many people involved, you know, it's got to be a church that that's alive. That's what a lot of us might think. You know, I remember <coughs> uh, a, a while ago, not a while, I mean, more than a while ago, a long time ago. Um, talking to a lady who um, was describing a church that she went to, um, I think it was in Texas, and she was, to, and it was a big church, and it was she was describing all the things and all the activities that go on. They have a ministry for this, and they have activities here, and this, and you know, it's just saying all these sorts of things. And she shook her head, just like, man, why did I ever leave that church? You know, as if you know, the fact that you have all those things going on is the mark of a healthy church. Now, I'm not going to say that that church is dead, it was dead, and the woman was wrong to think what she did. I mean, I don't know that church. It was in Texas, never heard of it before, never been there. I'm just trying, drawing, you know, what this woman uh, was saying and what her perception was of a church that just was just full of activity and full of all sorts of ministries. And, you know, just saying that it, the, the, the sense that she was communicating was that this was, this was a church that was alive. The thing that we have to ask and we have to ask ourselves is that how do we know that it's really alive? Is it it's just the fact that it has a lot of ministries here, here and there um, indicative of a, of a church that's alive? And because maybe it has a good reputation with people on the outside and say, hey, I can come here anytime and feel comfortable and blah, blah, blah. Um, they don't say anything that's, a fa- you know, whatever the case may be, use your imagination that that is the indication that that church is alive. Obviously, it's not. Obviously, there's other metrics that go on into this. I mean, just ask the people in Sardis. They'll tell you. You know, that doesn't that doesn't indicate that you're a church that's alive. So whatever whatever everybody else was thinking and whatever else they were saying about this church being alive, the reality and the true assessment that comes from Jesus Christ himself. Please understand that this is from this is Jesus Christ's own evaluation. His evaluation of this church is that you are that that you are dead, which gives us all the more warning that no matter where you are, what kind of church that you're involved with, it's very important that you look at yourselves very humbly and go before the Lord and ask him to search to search your hearts and everybody's hearts as far as it relates to your church and to give a true evaluation. It could be very easy to look around and say, it's very hard to believe that God would see anything wrong with our church. Look at all the things that are going on here. And listen, we don't have, it, the, you know, the world doesn't say anything bad about us. They don't get, they're not angry at us. They're not hostile towards us or anything. That's good, right? Yeah, I, I, I think again. In fact, I'd maybe be a little bit worried if, if, if you had churches where all the, the world had to say about them was good and not bad. I'm not saying that that churches should go and deliberately do things so that they could be spoken ill of of the church. All I'm saying is that, you know, continue to walk as you do in Christ and righteousness and people start saying stuff uh, soon enough. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so in verse two, Jesus says, wake up, okay, and strengthen what remains is in the, and is about to die. So again, like I mentioned several minutes ago, this isn't a, a, a full, complete death. But it's close, okay? This this church is on life support. Again, these are very shocking words for a church that has a reputation of being alive, okay? And so he says, he says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about and is about to die. So even what remains is 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 hanging on a is hanging on a on, on a small thread there. And they need and they need to do something about it quickly. And it, and it says there at the end uh, at the end of that sentence there and the and the end of verse two says for I have not found your works complete in the it, listen in the sight of my God and I think that that's the key. Their works weren't complete in the sight of God. And what you may have been dealing with is a church that thought that their works were, works were complete because everybody else approved of them. Everybody on the outside approved of what they were doing because it didn't ruffle any feathers, which may have been an indication of, you know, they were hesitant to to talk about um, things that, you know, what makes up sin. They were hesitant, hesitant to talk about the gospel, which would which would 
uh, which would suggest that people on the outside who didn't have that didn't accept the gospel, didn't have Christ, were were headed for judgment. I mean, those are hard things. You don't want to say those things. That'll drive people away. So let's just not just just forget about that and let's just do something fun. Say some fun things. Do you know whatever the case may be in order that we don't lose face with people of the world. And you might think that that's a better idea. Never mind. That's not what Scripture and that's not what Jesus Christ Himself says that we should be doing. But to us, it seems like a good idea. And so you know we look at that and we look at how people respond to that and say our works are complete. Jesus says, no, it's not in my sight, in my sight, they're not complete. Okay. So, you know, really in this evaluation, what you have are people who are more concerned about other people's evaluation and not the head of the church and his evaluation and God, the father's evaluation, God would look at the church in Sardis and say, your works are not complete in the sight of my God. And that's, what's truly important. So what did they, what should they do about this? Verse three, remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. Okay. So, you know, in a, in a, in a broad sense, in a broad sense, uh, what you could, what the way that you might be able to look at this, um, where it says, um, uh, uh, remember then what you, what you received and heard, keep it. You know, it, you know, in a broad sense, you might look at this as, you know, remembering what you received in the gospel itself and all of that, all that it contains and all the instructions that the word of God in general says and live by that. Keep what has been revealed to you. And that very much may be the case. I also want to I, I also want to uh, make available another um, possibility uh, that could, I mean, be in combination to what I just said before, but also it could be very much. Um, the whole thing of what Jesus himself has told this church specifically the direction and how they should uh, unfold their ministry um, within the city of Sardis, whatever that might be. If that's the case, and that's what we're dealing with mostly, we don't know specifically what Jesus Christ said. We, we just know that whatever it is, the church in Sardis decided to go their own way in order to secure and maintain a reputation among uh, the people in Sardis um, and be, and by, by that virtue, they, you know, they look like they're alive. Jesus says, no, don't listen to them. Listen to me. Worry about my evaluation. Remember what you received and heard and keep it. Okay. Do what I say <laughs> is really, is really the, is, is really the, the, the summation of what he's trying to say there. Okay. And it says, so it says, uh, remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. Okay. So obviously the direction that this church was going and what they were doing all in the name of popularity and ministry or whatever the case it was, obviously was in the wrong. And they needed to repent of that. They needed to repent of setting God's ways and Christ's ways aside for that particular church and deciding to go their own way and securing a reputation that really, you know, is of no value in the eyes of God. Okay repent of that and go back to what, uh, go back to what they had received and what they had heard. Okay. And I like, you know, I really am drawn again to the simplicity of the remedy here. We, we talked about this a little bit as it related to the, to the church in Ephesus and, and the, and their whole thing of, uh, remember, uh, the, the height from which you had fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. I mean, that's really the summation of the, of, of what the church in Ephesus was to, was told, uh, when they were told that they lost the love that they had at first. Same thing here, just as far as the remedy. It says, remember, and in other words, it's a matter of going back, take your minds back to what you heard and what you received, and keep that, okay? Nothing nothing complex or complicated about it. Think about what what I told you to do before, what's been, what's been revealed to you, what's been commanded you. Keep it and repent of what you did before by leaving that behind, all right? That's the remedy. That's the remedy that that uh, uh, that we have going on here. And so, th- I mean, it's really, just thinking about this takes me back to the to the, to the whole idea of, of things that I think about all the time is as it relates to church and the ministry of the church. And this is something that is especially on the forefront and the center of my mind. Me myself being a pastor is that anything that we do uh, as far as it relates to our church should be done biblically. And let me tell you, there are so many things it seems like that people do um, that are unbiblical for the, you know, for the purpose of 
um, of gaining favor with people of the world. Okay. You know, you might've heard, I've heard some people mention this before. Um, and you, you might have heard the same thing and you might agree with the evaluation of, you know, of my evaluation, even what other people say, as far as what they hear of this going on, people going around the people of the world and taking a survey, you know, asking, what do you, what would you want in a church? Um, in order so that they know how to best develop their church. Folks, that's nonsense. Let's say, okay, you know, whatever we put together, it's based on what these people say that they want. So if we put to, put this together and give the people what they want, never mind, these, these people aren't necessarily believers in Christ. But again, it's a draw to draw them in so that hopefully maybe we, ha- we can have the opportunity of, of preaching the gospel to them. And they put together this thing to, to please men Instead of going to scripture and saying, okay, what is, what is the Bible? What does scripture actually say about what we should be doing and how we, and and how we can draw attention from people uh, to people in the outside world to our message. Okay. It doesn't involve putting God's ways aside. It doesn't involve watering down the gospel or anything like that. That for sure, I can tell you. But the question is, are we are we being biblical? If we start going our own way and what's right in our own eyes and what seems wisest to us is not the same message that's given to Sardis the same for us if we're going that same direction. If we don't if we don't give two thoughts about what scripture says in our endeavors, in our ministry endeavors, in the direction that we go, aren't we really guilty of the same of the same thing that Sardis is doing? And wouldn't we ourselves have to repent also, just like they were called to repent and to keep what they received and heard at first. All right. So there's, so there's the, there's the, there's the order. There's the command. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. Now, still in the middle of verse three, if you do, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Okay, so here's a threat, you know, and we're not, we're, this isn't anything new. We've seen words of threat that, are, that have been given to these, um, to these different churches um, that we've looked at so far, um, with the exception of Smyrna, and also with what we're going to look at in Philadelphia, they are also an exception as well. Um, you know, where you have, where you have a threat of if you won't, if you don't do this, if you don't obey here, or if you don't repent here um, in Sardis, is, um, the whole thing is worded, if you will not um um, if you will not wake up, if you will not wake up, because remember, that's what they were told to do in verse in verse two, you know, which which, by the way, uh, you know, it kind of suggests a, a little bit of a lethargy, you know, and they, they become so lethargic to the things of God and the commands of God, you know, all at the expense of of of, you know, pleasing people of the world that they, you know, really. Uh, as far as their ministry within the within the city, it, 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 it they they become a sleeping church. Yeah, that's a mild form of putting it. Uh, you know, as it relates to their deadness, but they're told to wake up. Now, here in verse three, Jesus says, "If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you." So that's just that's just a, a threat of discipline. Again, what specifically that discipline is, we don't know. One thing that we do know is that this is not a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ because it does have second coming language there, doesn't it? When we hear stuff like a thief in the night, we usually asso- associate that sort of language with um, with with Jesus's second coming, and it does in those particular contexts in those in those passages of scripture. Also, you know, the whole thing of um, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Again, we hear stuff like that and we think second coming because those sorts of phrases have been associated with uh, the second coming. But we can't think of this, you know, these words uh, that Jesus is saying here to this local church as having to do with the second coming. It's not like their, uh, their lack of, um, of, of uh, waking up will therefore bring about the second coming of Christ. You know, if you don't repent, that then my second coming is going to happen, you know, and that sort of thing. That's not what we're dealing with. We also know that when it comes to the second coming, the church is not going to be God's target for wrath and judgment. It's going to be a matter of salvation for them, right? That's what the, that's what they're going to be looking forward to. So when you look at the words here in verse three, 
It says, um, if you will not wake up, I will come, uh, I will come like a thief and you will not know what I will, uh, what hour I will come against you. So, ne- so make no mistake. This is, you know, the church is going to be Jesus's target for, uh, for, uh, rebuke and for, um, and for, and for discipline, but it's not going to be judgment or, or, or eternal condemnation or anything like that. That's not, that's not something that the church worries about at the second coming of Christ. So when it, when Jesus is talking about, I will come like a thief and you won't know what hour that I'm going to come. It, it, it's very specific to them in time, not, not, um, not anything having to do with the second coming of Christ. Okay. But what we see here, um, is, is again, this, the, you know, Jesus Christ warns that I will discipline you in this if you do not turn around. Okay. And Jesus as the head of the church reserves the right to do that. Okay. And it's very important. We have to, we have to understand that Jesus is one who disciplines his people. Okay. And we've seen that. And we've seen this in the other letters before. We can't be shocked by those sorts of things. And in fact, the fact that Jesus Christ would rebuke his people and, and correct them is an indication that he does love his people because he wants them to wants them to return to the path of holiness. Okay. That's what we have to understand. We're going to, we're going to see that actually see that sort of language um, a couple of letters later when we, t- when we look at the, uh, the letter to the church in Laodicea. Okay. Uh, but of course I think we understand that that's true all around for other Christians and other churches all throughout time. Okay. So, in verse four, he says, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. OK, now this is this is the one thing that sets Sardis apart from a church like Laodicea. Remember, those are two churches uh, that don't have any commendation from the Lord, but it's all rebuke. This here is 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 one little small sort of uh, distinction um, from uh, that Sardis has from Laodicea, because at least with Sardis, and unlike Laodicea, uh, you know Sardis has a few people who have their heads on straight as it relates to all of this. And so he says in verse four, you still have you, uh, you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soil their garments. Now you think about a, a garment that's soiled, you know, you, you know, you could you go anywhere where the where it's dirty, where you get uh where there's dust, where there's dirt if you know, if we're talking about people who are out in the field and you know, you get dirt on your on your clothes and stuff like that, your 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 clothes are now dirty. You know, it's muddy and or, or whatever like that. And usually and that's the result of going somewhere where you get dirty. Instead of staying away from places where you think, oh, I got to keep my clothes clean, so stay away from here, here, because I might get dirty or something like that. And so that really falls more into line with what I think with what we're talking about here before, because if we're talking about a church that is worried about what the world thinks and therefore is is catering their ministry activity to the people of the world so that they have a good, a good reputation and a, favor, a favorable sight in their eyes, then really what you're dealing with is a worldly church. And a worldly church that has now stained themselves by being more tied to the world and being more worried about what the world says about them than what Jesus Christ himself says about them. And in that way, they've soiled their clothes. However, there are still a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. Okay, there's, there's, this, there's, there's, a, there's a small number there where there's hope with, with, with them. He says people who have not soiled their garments and and listen to what it says about them and they will walk with me in white now we think about white you know if we're talking about the whole thing of garments here their garments aren't soiled and their description of their of their of their garments are white you know we think of white we think about purity and so, and things that are unstained you know in in all of this listen all of this that we're talking about here here as it relates to that is really talking about holiness separateness okay being a distinct people. Now, of course, that's not saying that, you know, you don't rub shoulders with people of the world or interact with people of the world or anything like that. Then you would have to leave the world, according to Paul in first Corinthians in first Corinthians five. Right. But it's, but it's getting involved in their things for the sake of gaining favor with them that detracts from what Jesus Christ himself has, has told you to do. Okay. 
And so with these few, their garments are white. They want to they want to go about the path of righteousness that is holy and is pleasing to their God, but is not one that's necessarily going to meet with favor with everybody in the world. Okay, and I think that these are people who understand that. So they understand they want to keep the the, the purity of righteous conduct, righteous motivations, and all of all those things like that. They want to keep those things intact. Okay. And so as a result of that, what, you know, what does it say there? It says there, um, Jesus says, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Okay. They will walk with me. Now that, that's very, that has something that's, that's a very, that has very future connotations to it. And again, we're, we, we see the future aspect of something like this later on in the book of Revelation, when you get to places like Revelation 19. But I would be one who would even say that this is something that can be that can be very present, at least for at least for what, what you see here with the with the church in Sardis. Because one thing, if we're dealing with the church that's predominantly worried about what the world says and what the world thinks, are they ones who are walking step by step with with Jesus Christ and and worried about what He wants? Not necessarily, but with these few, they are walking with. They are walking with the with the Lord, or it says that they will. And I think the the whole thing of they will is that they will continue to as we as we go along in this whole thing. They will walk with me in white. In other words, they have the right motivations. They have the right passion and desire for righteousness. Um, you know, and they will they will walk with me as opposed to the, as, as opposed to the world. And that's a matter of grace, by the way. And you get a sense of that when it says, "For they are worthy." Okay. They are worthy not in and of themselves, but because of the righteousness that that Jesus Christ himself gives to them because they are true believers. It's the imputed righteousness. And it's because of that imputed righteousness that should have effect on how we live practically that ta- that that makes uh, that manifests practical righteousness as you as you walk in this world. And those two things working together demonstrates a people who are holy and not worried about and and not worried uh, in unnecessary ways worried about what the what the world thinks about them and and altering and managing your your way of life and your ministry in order to win a good reputation um in the world that that ends up that ends up putting by the wayside things that that Jesus Christ has told us to do as a people of God okay these people are worthy because because of because of what Christ has done for them. It's it's all a matter of grace. This whole thing of walking with them and walking with them in white, um, all by God's grace, they are worthy. Okay. So when you get to verse five, um, here we get here we get to that this the section to the ones who the ones who conquer section. Okay, and it says this still says something to or about the people in Sardis, believers in Sardis. But remember, this is something that is uh, that that is true of all believers, the whole church throughout all time, okay? In verse 5, where it says, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name, blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels, Okay? So that's so you have a few elements there that are going on here that describe the ones who conquer. Remember, the one who conquers is just another way of describing the Christian. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. This is the believer. Um, is is um, it's just the term that's used to describe them. Okay, so the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. Now this is the area where we see this applied to other to uh, to other believers. You see it specifically in places like uh, Revelation chapter seven verse nine. Um, you also see it in uh, Revelation chapter 19 um, and in verse 14. Um, that area specifically is talking about when Jesus Christ comes back, you see him on the white horse. And then in chapter 19, verse 14, it says, And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's a description of believers. Not anything as far as a particular congregation like it would be with Sardis. Now, it does involve them, but it involves more than just the, the Christians in Sardis. Okay. And also, if you if you were to revert your gaze up a little bit further in chapter 19 and verse 8, um, it talks about fine linen, bright and pure. 
And it says, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, again, those deeds are tied into the imputed righteousness that we have on credit because of Christ's righteousness that's been given to us. So those two things, I think, are, are things that work very closely together. Okay. So these are people, the one who conquers will be, will be those who are, uh, who are clothed thus in white garments. Okay. And again, the whole thing of white having to do with, with, with cleanliness, purity, you know, um, you know, not being stained or, or, un, or, or being unclean by being polluted or stained by the world. That's kind of drawing from, um, from words from, for example, like in James, uh, 127, um, you also th- talk about, you know, the whole thing of the holiness of the church, um, altogether when Paul in second Corinthians, um, I believe it's in, uh, chapter six where it talks about, uh, going away from, from those who are unclean and touch no unclean thing. Right. You know, that's, that's the sort of thing that was, that that's going on there now, because of the imputed righteousness that we have in Christ, we are, we do, we are righteous. Okay. And we do have that that purity aspect in an in an imputation sense. Is our our righteous deeds here on this earth always perfect? No. Um, but you know, we by the power of the Holy Spirit, we strive to walk in accordance with what is already true with us in in righteousness, and hopefully that righteousness manifests manifests itself um, as we walk now. And it's something that will definitely be um, a future reality um, in the future when Christ comes back. Okay, so the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Now, the book of life is something that we're going to see um, later on in the book of Revelation. You're going to see it particularly in chapter 13, um, you know, where it talks about uh, the people uh, whose names were uh, written in the book of life uh, from the foundation of the world. Um, If you look specifically, I'm going to I'm looking specifically at 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 verse um, eight of chapter 13 of Revelation it says, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. You know, the, the beast um, uh, will worship it. Everyone whose name uh, has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, in the book of life uh, of the lamb who was slain. So there it's talking about people whose names are not written in the book of life. And those people who aren't written in the book of life are those who dwell on the earth. And as we're going to explore later on, whenever Revelation talks about those who dwell on the earth, um, it's talking about the unbelieving world, people who are not Christians. But when they're talking about the, the Lamb's Book of Life, we notice it says that it, this was something that was written before the foundation of the world. So the you know our, our security in this is already said, and that's really what, what we have here when we're looking at chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 5, is the security of the believer. OK, which is something that's very important for uh, for these people in Sardis to understand specifically when we're talking about a threat of uh, when it, we're talking about a threat of discipline. Yes, that threat is looming over their heads. And even if, unfortunately, that were to come upon a church like that. What does that say about them eternally all around? Well, God visited some sort of a discipline or judgment on the church uh, in, in, in time. What does this say about them? Excuse me. What does this say about them in eternity? Well, from a in, from an eternal standpoint, there's hope and there's and there's um, and there's encouragement in the sense that, you know, that this doesn't mean that their name will be blotted out of the book of life. Their their name is there to stay. Notice it says, "I will never blot out his name out of the book of uh, out of the book of life." That th- your your name, if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, your name is written on there and it's written in permanent ink. And there's no way that it's going to be erased. OK, and that's on the promise of God himself. You know, if there's any if there's any case for the uh, th- for the security of the believer or as some people like to call it the perseverance of the saints. Here's one of them right here. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. It's not going anywhere. OK, now, listen. That's, that is, that is opposite of what you might have with people of the world. Okay. If you say, if you're, if you're dealing with people who say, well, we have to fashion our ministry this way and this way, because if we do it the way God does it, you know, it might offend some people and they'll, and they'll shun us. They'll say bad things about us and that sort of thing. You know, that, that, you know, the fact that our names aren't taken out when we haven't, when we haven't even been at our best, 
indicates the kind of God that we worship and the bad straits that the world is in, in the sense that you offend us, you say the wrong things, we're done with you. That should especially say something to us here in the 21st century as it relates to the whole ridiculous thing that you have going on with cancel culture. I mean, I don't know about you, how you feel about this, but cancel culture is, cancel culture is illegitimate all around. But even so, even as it in the stage that it's in right now, it's so, it's so mad, maddeningly, 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 is that even a word? I don't know. Out of this world and out of control. And people are canceled for the dumbest stuff. Okay. And people who are being canceled on social media and those are, and, and that sort of thing, they, these are people who aren't even Christians, but yet they say something that people in society say, hey, that's offensive, that's racist, that's, that's sexist, and, and things like that, and they aren't sexist or racist 99.9998% of the time, and they cancel them, or they're fired from you know this organization or from this movie set or something like that. If that's how it is with non-Christians, Imagine how it is for, for, for Christians if they stand up for what they believe in and they say this is wrong. You know, it, it's interesting, I've, and I've seen this before in times past and even more recently, um, where you have more prominent public Christian figures, if they're on a particular talk show or something, and they're asked about a, a specific sin or they're asked about salvation and they say, is, so is it true that you say, if, you know, if if you don't have Jesus Christ, then, then you're going to hell when you die. And you had these people who waffle say, well, you know what? I'm not one to judge. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I, I let God decide those sorts of things. And they don't, and they don't think, I'm sorry, this, this, this really bothers me. They don't take a freaking stand. They don't take a stand and uh, on the gospel and they waffle because they don't want to make people mad. And then when you have people who do speak the truth, I heard I heard recently a whole thing about Max Lucado, I think it was, who this wasn't even something recent, but something that he had said a few years ago. Things that were true, and I think the topic was about about traditional marriage and how homosexual marriage wasn't a thing, and he got attacked for that, and he apologized for that. He shouldn't be apologizing for what truth in Scripture actually says. Okay? Another example, I, I heard a clip of somebody, I forget what church they're from, but they were on The View and they were talking about abortion and they were asking about, you know, is abortion wrong? And he skirted around that issue and saying, you know, they would try not to, to focus on that. I just want to know the person's name and get to know him and that sort of thing. That it, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about here because we want to, we want to have favor with, with the world and knowing that if we give a straight answer, Done with gentleness and respect. We're not saying be jerks about it or anything, but but telling the truth with gentleness and re, with respect. We know that that's going to make a lot of people angry, and so what do we do? We skirt around the truth so that we can make people happy. Because if we tell the truth, people people will blot us out of their book. But guess what? Their book is not important. Their book means diddly compared to the fact that your name is in the book of life. And even when you do mess up, and even if I, God forbid, might mess up in this area, and I have to repent of that and say, "Oh God, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I totally disregarded what you told me I should do, and I was worried more about what other people would say um, than what you would say." You know, my my messed up portion of that is not going to erase my name from the book of life. And trust me, I've done many things, uncountable things that would, from a human perspective, you would think would disqualify me from the book of life. The same is true for you. That's the kind of God we serve, ladies and gentlemen. That's the kind of God that we serve. Okay? And so when you look at this last, this last portion here, and he says, and I, a, 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 um, the last part of verse five, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He says, I will, I will, I will confess his name. I will confess. I will confess his name before the father and before his angels. It has reminiscent of the words of Jesus in, in, uh, in Matthew ten thirty two. Um, you know, whoever confesses me before, uh, before men, I will also confess him before my father in heaven. 
you know, same deal. Now, what we're talking about here is that we're talking about people who have conquered, i.e., they are believers. Um, then, you know, what we're dealing with is is a is a whole th- is a whole thing where this is something where when we stand before before judgment, we're not going to be stand before judgment in the salvific uh, salvific salvific sense in the, the fact that we would be facing judgment. Instead, what we have is. You know, Jesus saying, I will confess his name before my father. In other words, he's saying he belongs to us. And of course, that's going to be made evident because your name is going to be written there in the book of life, which shows that you belong to him. That person belongs to us. I acknowledge that person. I bl- I acknowledge that man. I acknowledge that woman as belonging to me. Okay. And again, that's opposite that's counter to what you might have with people of the world remember say one wrong thing we're going to cancel you just like that we're going to blot your name out of our book of society i mean i just made that term up but you know you know you you call it whatever you want but i mean and so listen we're why would we be why would we be worried about what the world thinks and says about us in a negative way We've already got the acknowledgement of the highest per, uh, highest person, the highest being in the universe, God himself and his son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that what's most important? They might shun you, but God's not going to. And yet we would be so worried about, oh, I, I hope I don't say this so that they get mad at me because they're offended that, by the fact that, that they, that we think that they're, or we say that they're sinners. Folks, we already got the greatest acknowledgement We've got the greatest acknowledgement in the person of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Isn't that enough? Now, again, I'm not saying that that we that we're careless with the way that we live and the way that we talk towards other people, and that we want to be kind and we want to have a reputation of 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 being good people in in as we walk in righteousness with God. I mean, there there's something to be said about that. But I'm talking about when it comes to being faithful to the truth and being faithful to right proper ministry and knowing that that might get us in trouble, putting that aside for the sake of making the world happy so that they don't cancel us or that they don't blot us out of their book. Look, we already got the highest commendation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Why do you want anything else? Why are you so worried about that? But instead you trade that out for the sake of trying to to earn favor with, with the world. When that's your attitude, is it any wonder that a church turns dead? Because the Lord isn't isn't with that church. The Lord isn't going to put a stamp of approval on a church like that that predominantly is worried about that when a church has walked away from the will that's revealed to them in Scripture. Okay? And that's the message that, that's given to the church in Sardis. And so he says in verse 6, and this is something that's broadcast to all the churches. Says, he who has an, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, let this sink in deep. Listen carefully to these things. You know? So, let's be concerned. Let's be more concerned with what Jesus Christ says and what he has to say and what he's given us to do. And not so much with what the, what the world might think of us. And what the world might say about us. Listen, scripture's already said that the world is going to hate us. It's already said that. You might as well you might as well accept that and move on. And uh and not and not set aside what what, what the Lord has said in order to work in a way so as to make the world be of favor to you in an unbiblical way. And I want to make that distinction because we do want to have, as a people of God, we do want to have a good reputation in the world, but it's as it relates to us walking in righteousness and the power of the Holy Spirit and walking according to his ways. And that reputation is going to be labeled with labeled good with some people, but again, not with, every, with not with everybody. Again, this is something that we, that we, uh, that we laid out when we were, uh, when we were looking at the book of first Peter several months back. So even in that, it's not a guarantee that, that the reputation is going to take hold with everybody. Some people might see your good works and your good righteousness and they'll hate you for it. Okay. But setting those things aside 
and doing your own thing so that the world will like you better is not the way that you need to be going. And it's not the way that I need to be going or any of our churches need to be going. And let's, let's evaluate, let's ask the Lord to evaluate our hearts seriously on these sorts of things. Because again, with Sardis, this, you know, these words might've been, you were probably, a, you know, a big shock to them. And it could be easy for us in the 21st century to, to, to prop ourselves confidently and say, you know, that's, you know, Sardis, we don't have a Sardis problem and we're not dead. You know, we might have the same rude awakening um, with us that Sardis did back in the first century. So a little bit of humility is in order for us as well. We fall, we come before the Lord and we ask God, God, you know, evaluate us. Where are we in this? Convict our hearts in areas where we are doing a cruddy job, but also be faithful in, in, in leading us in the right path, you know, and that sort of thing. Are, are we like a Sardis? I don't know. It's easy to say that we're not, but Sardis wouldn't have said that about themselves either. And look what the Lord Jesus said about them. Okay. Or it might be like, you know, but you know, the, the Lord, you know, is, is pleased with where you are. It might, that might very well be the case too. It's just a matter of, we need to be, we need to come at this with a, with a very humble mind and a very humble heart and ask the Lord to evaluate us, evaluate us and be, have our hearts open to the, to the thought that maybe the Lord will show us that we are far from where we need to be. And it actually might be in a serious condition. Okay. So that's the church of Sardis. Okay. So, um, I, 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 you know, some hard hitting words and I know I got a little, uh, um, my emotional state got a little edgy there just as I was talking about things there near the end, but it really does bother me when I, when I hear people do the things that say the things that they say, and it's obvious that they're skirting away from the, from the truth when they're asked a direct question. Um, and that's not anything new. I've seen that for, for years and, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes you, you might think, well, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Would you, would you do the same thing? Listen, I don't, I've never been on a, on a public national, uh, television platform, but I have been in situations with other people who are again, who, who are against what I, what I stand for. And I've had to say some hard things and give hard answers to questions that they ask me, knowing that the answer that I give them is going to make them angry. And I give them the answer again with gentleness and respect. I'm not a rude jerk or anything like that. And sure enough, that answer that comes from scripture made them angry. Okay. That's the cost of, of, of standing by the truth. Okay. That's what we have to do. And I know it's tough. I know we want people to like, listen, folks, I, I understand it's tough, but we already have, like I said, we already have the greatest commendation that we can ever have. And that's from Jesus Christ himself. He says, I'm going to confess your name before my father in heaven. Isn't that enough? Right? Isn't that enough? So I'm just going to let that, that hang and let your, um, and let your hearts and your minds wrestle with that, with that question. Okay. As we leave this time. All right. So we will leave it there. Okay. Um, if you like the show, and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, um, also on um, iHeartRadio and YouTube. You can also follow Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L-T-S-E-R-I-P-T-S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right, friends. Um, glad uh, we were able to look at this together. I think it was a good examination. I had a good time uh, going through it. Um, next time, we're going to dip into the church in Philadelphia, not sure if we're going to cover all of Philadelphia next week or if we're going to break it up in two. Haven't decided on that yet, um, but um, I guess you'll see once we once uh, um, once next episode is posted. So, uh, Phil, the church in Philadelphia next time. I'm sure that there will be a lot of things um, in uh, good things in store for that examination as well. But uh, my name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.